a Wikividi Documentaries production. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Enjoy. Nick Drake Nicholas Rodney Drake was an English singer-songwriter and musician, known for his acoustic guitar-based songs. He failed to find a wide audience during his lifetime, but his work has posthumously achieved wider notice and recognition. Drake signed to Ireland Records when he was 20 years old, while a student at the University of Cambridge, and released his debut album, Five Leaves Left, in 1969. By 1972, he had recorded two more albums, Brighter Later and Pink Moon. Neither sold more than 5,000 copies on initial release. His reluctance to perform a live, or be interviewed, contributed to his lack of commercial success. No footage of the adult Drake has ever been released, only still photographs and home footage from his childhood. Drake was initially believed to suffer from major depression, although he was later diagnosed with schizophrenia, and his struggles with mental health were often reflected in his lyrics. After making Pink Moon, he withdrew from both live performance and recording, retreating to his parents' home in rural Warwickshire. On 25 November 1974, at the age of 26, Drake died from an overdose of approximately 30 amitriptyline pills, a prescribed antidepressant. His cause of death was determined to be suicide. Drake's music remained available into the mid-1970s, but the 1979 release of the retrospective album Fruit Tree allowed his back catalogue to be reassessed. By the mid-1980s Drake was being credited as an influence by such artists as Robert Smith, David Sylvian, and Peter Buck. In 1985, the Dream Academy reached the UK and US charts with Life in a Northern Town, a song written for and dedicated to Drake. By the early 1990s, he had come to represent a certain type of doomed romantic musician in the UK music press. His first biography was published in 1997, followed in 1998 by the documentary film A Stranger Among Us. In 1999, his song, Pink Moon, was used in a Volkswagen commercial, resulting in an increase in his US album sales. As of 2006 he has sold 907,000 albums since Nielsen Soundscan began tracking data in 1991, and in fact, only 12% of that figure was sold before 2000. As of 2014 since his death he has sold 2.4 million albums and downloads in Britain and the United States alone. Early Life Drake's father, Rodney Shuttleworth Drake, had moved to Rangoon, Burma, in the early 1930s to work as an engineer with the Bombay Burma Trading Corporation. There, in 1934, his father met the daughter of a senior member of the Indian Civil Service, Mary Lloyd, known to her family as Molly. Rodney Drake proposed to her in 1936, though they had to wait a year until she turned 21 before her family allowed them to marry. In 1950 they returned to England to live in Warwickshire at their home. Farleys, in Tanworth in Arden, south of Birmingham, the city where Rodney Drake worked from 1952 as the chairman and managing director of Wolseley Engineering. Nick's older sister, Gabrielle, became a successful film and television actress. Both parents were musically inclined and each wrote pieces of music. Recordings of Molly Drake's songs, which have come to light since her death, are remarkably similar in tone and outlook to the later work of her son. Mother and son shared a similar fragile vocal delivery. Both Gabrielle and biographer Trevor Dan have noted a parallel sense of foreboding and fatalism in their music. Encouraged by his mother, Drake learned to play piano at an early age and began to compose songs which he recorded on a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder she kept in the family drawing room. In 1957, Drake was sent to Eagle House School, a preparatory boarding school near Sandhurst, Berkshire. Five years later, he went to Marlborough College, a public school in Wiltshire, attended by his father, grandfather, and great-grandfather. He developed an interest in sport, becoming an accomplished sprinter over 100 and 200 yards, representing the school's open team in 1966. He played rugby for the C1 House team and was appointed a house captain in his last two terms. School friends recall Drake at this time as having been confident and quietly authoritative, while often aloof in his manner. His father Rodney remembered. In one of his reports, the headmaster said that none of us seemed to know him very well. All the way through with Nick, people didn't know him very much. Drake played piano in the school orchestra, 
and learned clarinet and saxophone. He formed a band, the Perfumed Gardeners, with four schoolmates in 1964 or 1965. With Drake on piano and occasional alto sax and vocals, the group performed Pi International R&B covers and jazz standards, as well as the Yardbirds and Manfred Mann numbers. Chris DeBurra asked to join the band, but was rejected as his taste was seen as too poppy by the other members. His academic performance began to deteriorate and, while he had accelerated a year in Eagle House, at Marlborough he began to neglect his studies in favor of music. In 1963 he attained seven GCEO levels, fewer than his teachers had been expecting, failing, physics with chemistry, a fallback, for students who struggled with science. In 1965, Drake paid £13 for his first acoustic guitar, Eleven, which was a cheaper option than a Martin D28, and was soon experimenting with open tuning and finger-picking techniques. In 1966 Drake enrolled at a tutorial college in Five Ways, Birmingham, from where he won a scholarship to study English literature at Fitzwilliam College, Cambridge. He delayed attendance to spend six months at the University of Aix-Marseille, France, beginning in February 1967, where he began to practice guitar in earnest. To earn money, he would often busk with friends in the town center. Drake began to smoke cannabis, and he traveled with friends to Morocco. According to traveling companion Richard Charkin, that was where you got the best pot. He most likely began using LSD while in X, and lyrics written during this period, in particular for the song, Clothes of Sand, are suggestive of an interest in hallucinogens. Cambridge On returning to England, Drake moved into his sister's flat in Hampstead, London, before enrolling at Fitzwilliam College, Cambridge University that October to study English literature. His tutors found him to be a bright student, but unenthusiastic and unwilling to apply himself. His biographer, Trevor Dan, notes that he had difficulty connecting with staff and fellow students alike, and points out that official matriculation photographs from this time reveal a sullen young man. Cambridge placed much emphasis on its rugby and cricket teams, yet by this time Drake had lost interest in playing sport, preferring to stay in his college room smoking cannabis and listening to and playing music. According to fellow student Brian Wells, they were the ruggabuggers and we were the cool people smoking dope. In September 1967, he met Robert Kirby, a music student who went on to orchestrate many of the string and woodwind arrangements for Drake's first two albums. By this time, Drake had discovered the British and American folk music scenes, and was influenced by performers such as Bob Dylan, Donovan, Van Morrison, Josh White, and Phil Oakes. He began performing in local clubs and coffee houses around London, and in February 1968, while playing support to Country Joe and the Fish at the Roundhouse in Camden Town, made an impression on Ashley Hutchings, bass player with Fairport Convention. Hutchings recalls being impressed by Drake's skill as a guitarist, but even more so by the image. He looked like a star. He looked wonderful, he seemed to be seven feet tall. Hutchings introduced Drake to the 25-year-old American producer Joe Boyd, owner of the production and management company Witch Season Productions. The company was, at the time, licensed to Island Records and Boyd, the man who had discovered Fairport Convention and been responsible for introducing John Martin, and the incredible string band to a mainstream audience, was a significant and respected figure on the UK folk scene. He and Drake formed an immediate bond, and the producer acted as a mentor to Drake throughout his career. A four-track demo, recorded in Drake's college room in early 1968, led Boyd to offer a management, publishing, and production contract to the 20-year-old and to initiate work on a debut album. According to Boyd in those days you didn't have cassettes, he brought a reel-to-reel -reel tape to me that he'd done at home. Halfway through the first song, I felt this was pretty special. And I called him up, and he came back in, and we talked, and I just said, I'd like to make a record. He stammered, oh, well, yeah. Okay. Nick was a man of few words. In a 2004 interview, Drake's friend Paul Wheeler remembered the excitement caused by his seeming big break, and recalled that the singer had already decided not to complete his third year at Cambridge. Five Leaves Left 
Drake began recording his debut album Five Leaves Left later in 1968, with Boyd assuming the role of producer. The sessions took place in Sound Techniques Studio, London, with Drake skipping lectures to travel by train to the capital. Inspired by John Simon's production of Leonard Cohen's first album, Boyd was keen that Drake's voice would be recorded in a similar close and intimate style, with no shiny pop reverb. He sought to include a string arrangement similar to Simon's, without overwhelming or sounding cheesy. To provide backing, Boyd enlisted various contacts from the London folk rock scene, including Fairport Convention guitarist Richard Thompson and Pentangle bassist Danny Thompson. To provide string arrangements, Boyd already had in mind Richard A. Hewson. Initial recordings did not go well, the sessions were irregular and rushed, taking place during studio downtime borrowed from Fairport Convention's production of their unhalfbreaking album. Tension arose between artist and producer Raz. To the direction the album should take, Boyd was an advocate of George Martin's, using the studio as an instrument, approach, while Drake preferred a more organic sound. Dan has observed that Drake appears, tight and anxious, on bootleg recordings taken from the sessions, and notes a number of Boyd's unsuccessful attempts at instrumentation. Both were unhappy with Hewson's contribution, which they felt was too mainstream in sound for Drake's songs. Drake suggested using his college friend Robert Kirby as a replacement, though Boyd was skeptical about taking on an amateur music student lacking prior recording experience, he was impressed by Drake's uncharacteristic assertiveness, and agreed to a trial. Kirby had previously presented Drake with some arrangements for his songs, however, Kirby did not feel confident enough to score the album's centerpiece, River Man, and Boyd was forced to stretch the witch season budget to hire the veteran composer Harry Robertson, with the instruction that he echo the tone of Delius and Ravel. Post-production difficulties led to the release being delayed by several months. It has been alleged that the album was poorly marketed and supported. Though the inclusion of the opening track, Time Has Told Me, on the island record sample Nice Enough to Eat brought him a very wide audience. Drake was featured in full-page interviews in the pop press. In July, Melody Maker referred to the album as, poetic, and, interesting. Though NME wrote in October that there was, not nearly enough variety to make it entertaining. It received radio plays, from the BBC's more progressive disc jockeys such as John Peel and Bob Harris. Drake was unhappy with the Inlace Leave, which printed songs in the wrong running order and reproduced verses omitted from the recorded versions. In an interview his sister Gabrielle said, He was very secretive. I knew he was making an album, but I didn't know what stage of completion it was at until he walked into my room and said, There you are. He threw it onto the bed and walked out brighter later. Drake ended his studies at Cambridge nine months before graduation, and in autumn 1969 moved to London. His father remembered, writing him long letters, pointing out the disadvantages of going away from Cambridge. A degree was a safety net, if you manage to get a degree, at least you have something to fall back on. His reply to that was that a safety net was the one thing he did not want. Drake spent his first few months in the capital drifting from place to place, occasionally staying at his sister's Kensington flat, but usually sleeping on friends' sofas and floors. Eventually, in an attempt to bring some stability and a telephone into Drake's life, Boyd organized and paid for a ground-floor bedsit in Belsize Park, Camden. On 5 August 1969, Drake recorded five songs for the BBC's John Peel show, three of which were broadcast on the following night. A month later, on 24 September, he opened for Fairport Convention at the Royal Festival Hall in London, followed by appearances at folk clubs in Birmingham and Hull. Remembering the performance in Hull, folk singer Michael Chapman commented the folkies did not take to him. They wanted songs with choruses. They completely missed the point. He didn't say a word the entire evening. It was actually quite painful to watch. I don't know what the audience expected. I mean, they must have known they weren't going to get sea shanties and sing-alongs at a Nick Drake gig. The experience reinforced Drake's decision to retreat from live appearances. The few concerts he did play around this time were usually brief, awkward, and poorly attended. Drake seemed reluctant to perform, and rarely addressed his audience. As many of his songs were played in different tunings, he frequently paused to retune between numbers. Although the publicity generated by Five Leaves Left was minor, Boyd was keen to build on what momentum there was. 
1971's Brighter Later, again produced by Boyd and engineered by John Wood, introduced a more upbeat, jazzier sound. Disappointed by his debut's poor commercial performance, Drake sought to move away from his pastoral sound, and agreed to his producer's suggestions to include bass and drum tracks on the recordings. It was more of a pop sound, I suppose, Boyd later said. I imagined it as more commercial, like its predecessor. The album featured musicians from Fairport Convention, as well as contributions from John Cale on two songs, Northern Sky, and Fly. Trevor Dan has noted that while sections of Northern Sky sound more characteristic of Cale, the song was the closest Drake came to a release with chart potential. In his 1999 autobiography, Cale admits to using heroin during this period, and his older friend Brian Wells suspected that Drake was also using both Boyd and Wood were confident that the album would be a commercial success, but it sold fewer than 3,000 copies. Reviews were again mixed, while Record Mirror praised Drake as a beautiful guitarist, clean and with perfect timing, and, accompanied by soft, beautiful arrangements, Melody Maker described the album as an awkward mix of folk and cocktail jazz. Soon after its release, Boyd sold Witch Season to Island Records, and moved to Los Angeles to work with Warner Brothers in the development of soundtracks for film. The loss of his key mentor, coupled with the album's poor sales, led Drake to further retreat into depression. His attitude to London had changed, he was unhappy living alone, and visibly nervous and uncomfortable performing at a series of concerts in early 1970. In June, Drake gave one of his final live appearances at Yule Technical College, Surrey. Ralph McTell, who also performed that night, remembered that Nick was monosyllabic. At that particular gig he was very shy. He did the first set and something awful must have happened. He was doing his song Fruit Tree and walked off halfway through it. Just left the stage. His frustration turned to depression. And in 1971 Drake was persuaded by his family to visit a psychiatrist at St. Thomas Hospital, London. He was prescribed a course of antidepressants, but felt uncomfortable and embarrassed about taking them, and tried to hide the fact from his friends. He knew enough about drugs to worry about their side effects, and was concerned about how they would react with his regular cannabis use. Brought to you by Wikividi Documentaries. Would you like